soup, and they mingled with the smell of dust and horses from outside. Well, food was a problem in a town jammed with refugees and soldiers, and more in camps all around it. Men's voices singing raucous marching songs came and went in the street. The sounds of boots and horses' hooves, and men cursing the heat. The common room was hot, too, without a breath of air stirring. Had the windows been swung out, dust would soon have coated everything inside, and it still would not have done much for the heat inside. Mayrone was a griddle. As far as Matt could see, the whole bloody world was drying up, and he did not want to think about why. He wished he could forget the heat, forget why he was in Mayrone, forget everything. His good green coat, gold embroidered on collar and cuffs, was undone, his fine linen shirt unlaced, Yet he still sweated like a horse. It might have helped to remove the black silk scarf looped around his neck, but he seldom did where anyone could see. Draining the last of his wine, he set the burnished pewter cup on the table at his elbow and picked up his broad-brimmed hat to fan himself. Whatever he drank no sooner went in than he sweated it out. When he chose to stay at the Golden Stag, the lords and officers of the Band of the Red Hand followed his lead which meant all others stayed clear. End of Disc 5. Disc 6. When he chose to stay at the Golden Stag, the lords and officers of the Band of the Red Hand followed his lead, which meant all others stayed clear. That usually did not displease Mistress Dalvin. She could have rented out every bed five times over just among the lords and lordlings of the band. And that sort paid well, had few fights, and usually took them outside before spilling blood. This midday, however, only nine or ten men occupied the tables, and she occasionally blinked at the empty benches, patted at her bun, and sighed. She would not sell much wine before evening. A large part of her profits came from wine. The musicians played vigorously, though. A handful of lords pleased with the music. Anyone with gold deserved him a lord, so far as they were concerned could be more generous than a room full of common soldiers. Unfortunately for the musicians' purses, Matt was the only man listening, and he winced at every third note. It really was not their fault. The music sounded fine, if you did not know what you were listening to. Matt did. He had taught it to them, clapping the beat and humming. But no one else had heard that tune in more than 2,000 years. The best to be said was that they had the rhythms right. A bit of conversation caught his ear. Tossing his hat down, he waved his cup to signal for more wine and leaned across his table toward the three men drinking around the next. What was that? We are trying to figure out how to win some of our money back from you, Tomana said, unsmiling over his wine cup. He was not upset. Only a few years older than Matt's twenty, and a head shorter, Talmanis seldom smiled. The man always made Matt think of a compressed spring. No one can beat you at cards. The commander of half of the band's cavalry, he was a lord here in Kyrian, but the front of his head was shaved and powdered, though sweat had washed some of it away. A good many younger Kyrian lords had taken up soldiers' styles. Talmanis' coat was plain, too, without a nobleman's slashes of color, although he was entitled to quite a few. Not so, Matt protested. True, when his luck was in, it was perfect, but it ran in cycles, especially with things that had as much order as a deck of cards. Lord Nashes, you won fifty crowns from me last week. Fifty crowns. A year or so ago, he would have turned backflips at winning one crown, and wept at the thought of losing one. A year or so ago, he had not had one to lose. How many hundred behind does that leave me? Tomanis asked dryly. I want a chance to win some back. If he ever did start winning against Matt with any consistency, he would start worrying, too. Like most of the band, he took Matt's luck as a talisman. Dice are no bloody good, Darren said. Commander of the band's foot, he drank thirstily and ignored a grimace only half hidden behind Elysian's oiled beard. Most nobles Matt had met thought dice common, fit only for peasants. I've never seen you end the day behind a dice. It has to be something you have no control over, no hand in, if you understand. 
just a little taller than his fellow Kyrenian Talmanis. Gered was a good 15 years older, his nose broken more than once, and three white scars crisscrossing his face. The only one of the three not nobly born, he wore the front of his head shaved and powdered too. Derrick had been a soldier all his life. We thought horses, an Elysian put in, gesturing with his pewter mug. A blocky man, taller than either of the Kyrenian. He led the other half of the cavalry in the band. Given the heat, Matt often wondered why he kept his luxuriant black beard, but he trimmed it every morning to keep the point sharp. And where Darren and Tomanis wore their plain gray coats hanging open, Elysian had his, green silk with those padded tyrant sleeves, striped and cuffed in gold satin, buttoned to the neck. His face glistened with sweat that he ignored. Burn my soul, but your luck holds hard with battle and cards. And dice, he added with another grimace at Darren. But in horse racing, it's all the horse. Matt smiled and propped his elbows on the table. Find yourself a good horse and we'll see. His luck might not affect a horse race. Aside from dice and cards and the like, he could never be sure what it would touch or when. But he had grown up watching his father trade horse flesh, and his own eye for a horse was fairly sharp. Do you want this wine or not? I cannot pour it if I cannot reach your cup. Matt glanced over his shoulder. The serving maid behind him, with a polished pewter pitcher, was short and slim, a dark-eyed, pale-cheeked beauty with black curls nestling on her shoulders. And that precise, musical, Kyrenian accent made her voice into chimes. He had had his eye on Betsy Sylvan since the first day he walked into the Golden Stag. This was his first chance to speak to her. There were always five things that needed doing immediately, and ten that should have been done yesterday. The other men had already buried their faces in their wine, leaving him as alone with the woman as they could without walking out. They had manners, even the two nobles. Grinning, Matt swung his legs over the bench and held out his cup for her to fill. Thank you, Betsy, he said, and she bobbed a curtsy. When he asked her to pour one for herself and join him, however, she set the pitcher on the table, folded her arms, and tilted her head to one side, eyeing him up and down. I hardly think Mistress Dale then would like that. Oh, no, I do not think she would. Are you a lord? They all seem to jump for you, but no one calls you my lord. They barely even bow, just the commoners. Matt's eyebrow shot up. No, he said, more curtly than he wished. I am not a lord. Rand could let people run around calling him Lord Dragon and the like, but that was not for Matrim Coffin. No, indeed. Taking a deep breath, he put his grin back on. Some women tried to nudge a man off balance, but it was a dance he was good at. Just call me Matt, Betsy. I'm sure Mistress Dillman won't mind if you just sit with me. Oh, yes, she would, but I suppose I can talk a bit. You must be almost a lord. Why are you wearing that in this heat? Leaning forward, she pushed his scarf down with a finger. He had not been paying attention, and had let it slip a little. What's this? She ran her finger along the pale, thickened ridge that circled his neck. Did someone try to hang you? Why? You are too young to be a hardened scofflaw. He pulled his head back and hastily retied the black silk to hide his scar, but Betsy was not put off. Her hand dipped into the unlaced front of his shirt to pull up the silver foxhead medallion he wore in a leather thong. Was it for stealing this? It looks valuable. Is it valuable? Matt snatched the medallion away, stuffed it back where it belonged. The woman hardly drew breath, certainly not enough man to get a word in. He heard Nelesian and Darren chuckling behind him, and his face darkened. Sometimes his luck with gambling was stood on its head with women, and they always found it funny. No, they would not have let you keep it if you stole it, would they? Betsy chattered on. And if you are almost a lord, I suppose you can own things like that. Perhaps it was because you knew too much. You look a young man who knows a great deal, or thinks he does. She smiled one of those shrewd little smiles that women wore when they wanted to fuddle a man. It seldom meant they knew anything, but they could make you think they did. Did they try to hang you for thinking you knew too much? Or was it for pretending to be a lord? Are you sure you are not a lord? 
Darren and Elysian were laughing right out now, and even Talmanis was chuckling, though they tried to pretend it was about something else. Darren wheezingly interjected some tale about a man falling off a horse whenever he had breath enough, but there was nothing funny in the bits Matt heard. He kept his grin on, though. He was not going to be routed, even if she could talk faster than he could run. She was very pretty, and he had spent the last few weeks talking to the likes of Darren and worse, Sweaty men who sometimes forgot to shave and too often had no chance to bathe. Perspiration heated Betsy's cheeks, but she gave off a faint smell of lavender-scented soap. Actually, I got that scratch for knowing too little, he said lightly. Women always liked it when you played down your scars. The light knew he was growing enough of them. I know too much now, but too little then. You could say I was hanged for knowledge. Shaking her head, Betsy pursed her lips. That sounds like it is supposed to be witty, Matt. Lordlings say witty things all the time, but you say you are not a lord. Besides, I'm a simple woman. Wit goes right over my head. I think simple words are best. Since you are not a lord, you should speak simply, or else some might think you were playing at being a lord. No woman likes a man pretending to be what he is not. Maybe you could explain what you were trying to say. Maintaining his smile was an effort. Bandying words with her was not going at all the way he wanted. He could not tell whether she was a complete nit or just managing to make him trip over his ears, trying to keep up. Either way, she was still pretty, and she still smelled of lavender, not sweat. Darren and Elysian seemed to be choking to death. Tomanus was humming a frog on the ice. So he was skidding about with his feet in the air, was he? Matt put down his wine cup and rose, bowing over Betsy's hand. I am who I am, no more, but your face drives words right out of my head. That made her blink. Whatever they said, women always like flower and talk. Will you dance? Not waiting for an answer, he led her toward where a clear floor stretched the length of the common room and through the tables. With luck, dancing with his slower tongue a little, and he was lucky, after all. Besides, he had never heard of a woman whose heart was not softened by dancing. Dance with her, and she will forgive much. Dance well, and she will forgive anything. That was a very old saying. Very old. Betsy hung back, biting her lip and looking for Mistress Daleman. But the plump little innkeeper only smiled and waved Betsy on then patted ineffectually at the tendrils escaping her bun and went back to chivying the other serving maids as though the tables were full. Mistress Delvin would have been all over any man she thought was behaving improperly. Despite her placid appearance, she kept a short cudgel in her skirts and sometimes used it. Elysian still eyed her carefully when she came close. But if a free-spending man wanted a dance, what was the harm in that? He held Betsy's hands outstretched to either side. There should be just enough room between the tables. Musicians began to play louder, if no better. Follow me, he told her. The steps are simple to start. In time to the music, he began. Dip and a gliding side step to the right, left foot sliding after. Dip and a gliding step and slide, with arms outstretched. Betsy got on quickly, and she was light on her feet. When they reached the musicians, he smoothly lifted her hands overhead and spun himself and her back to back. Then it was dip and sidestep, twirl, face to face, dip, sidestep and twirl, again and again, all the way back to where they began. She fell into that just as swiftly, smiling at the dip and delight whenever the turns allowed. She truly was pretty. A little more complicated now, he murmured, turning so they faced the musicians side by side, wrists crossed and hands linked in front of them. Right knee up, slight kick left, then glide forward and right. Left knee up, slight kick right, then glide forward and left. Betsy laughed as they wove their way to the performers once more. The steps became more intricate with each passage, but she needed only one demonstration to match him, light as a feather in his hands with each twist and turn and spin. Best of all, she did not say a word. The music caught him up, Miss notes and all, and the pattern dance, and memories floated in his head as they floated back and forth across the floor. 
In memory, he was a head taller with long golden mustaches and blue eyes. He wore a red sashed coat of amber silk with a ruffle of finest barcine lace and yellow sapphire studs from Aramail on his chest. And he danced with a darkly beautiful emissary of the Atha'an Mier, the sea folk. The fine gold chain linking her nose ring to one of her multitude of earrings held a tiny medallion 